Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for this evening. Uh, Professor Ann White is the head of the Department of Nuclear Science and Engineering. Uh, she received a PhD in physics at UCLA and uh, performed research at the Electric uh, Tokamak at UCLA, NST NSTX, uh, and at General Atomics before uh, joining MIT as, as a faculty member. Uh, Professor White has served on a number of institute-wide committees. She's currently co-chairing the MIT Climate Nucleus charged with managing and implementing MIT's new climate action plan. Her research focuses on magnetic fusion energy, includes research in diagnostic development, turbulence and transport physics, and uh, transport model validation on four tokamaks. Uh, at the Plasma Science and Fusion Center, she has been assistant division head uh, for MFE collaborations and, has, and ran the gyrokinetic simulation working group, the Alcator CMOD transport group. She is currently on the uh, Fusion Energy Sciences Advisory Committee, helped author the 2018 FESAC report, Transformative Enabling Capabilities for Efficient Advance Towards Fusion Energy. And more recently in 2021, uh, Powering the Future, Fusion and Plasmas. These reports define the role of fusion as transformative technology, lay out strategic actions and recommendations for the future of the US fusion program. I know we're all very excited to get on uh, to hear her presentation. Just a couple of housekeeping announcements. Um, everyone here should be muted. It's a webinar, so you, uh, you can't unmute yourself. We will do questions and answers at the end of Professor White's presentation. And you should put your questions uh, in the Q&A box instead of the chat. And we'll try to get through as many as, as we can at the, at the end. Uh, so with that, I will uh, hand it over to, uh, to Professor White. Well, thank you so much, Megan, and thanks to the Alumni Club of Boston for inviting me to speak at the first ever June. That's, that's very exciting. I'm very happy to be here and happy to share with you some of the exciting things that are going on in fusion, not just at, uh, not just at MIT, uh, but also a little bit around the world. And so mostly I'm going to try to answer this question, why is it a fast track now? Why is now the moment for fusion? Uh, fusion's time in the sun, if you will. So if you're here, you're excited about fusion, like I am. Uh, it's, it's really an ultimate energy source for, for humankind. And we've known this for a while. The value proposition for fusion energy is truly enormous. You have an abundant fuel, uh, deuterium and tritium, isotopes of hydrogen, this fuel is sourced ultimately from water and rocks, deuterium straight from the ocean. Uh, and you can create more of your tritium fuel uh, through reactions between lithium, which comes from rocks uh, and neutrons. Uh, fusion would result in an abundant source of energy that also produces no air pollution, no greenhouse gas emissions, no carbon emissions, and there's very little waste, not zero, but very little, uh, and also minimum land use. Fusion reactions combine light nuclei into heavier nuclei, so it's the opposite of fission, uh, which is about breaking apart heavier nuclei into lighter ones. And this reaction that you see here in the slide on the top right um, is not the reaction that powers the sun, of course, but this is a reaction between deuterium and tritium, which forms a helium nucleus and a neutron. And it's the most favorable one for energy applications on earth. Um, most favorable means it's the easiest for us to do. Uh, so the other cool value proposition about fusion is that um, the fuel is extraordinarily high energy density, about four times, uh, four times the amount that you get per nucleon from fission, which is already very high energy density. And what this means, and why I'm showing you a picture of a, of a pickup truck, is that uh, if you filled a pickup truck up with uh, fusion fuel, it'd be enough fuel to sort of power Boston for a year. Uh, so it re really gets into how much we could do with so little. And this is why uh, scientists have been chasing uh, this, this fusion dream for so long. So making energy from fusion requires that, that fuel, that deuterium and that tritium, uh, is at very high temperatures, uh, very high temperatures not naturally found on the surface of the earth. 
Uh, so you're probably familiar with four states of matter, or maybe just the first three, uh, solid, liquid, and gas. And you know, when you keep adding energy to any of these states of matter, adding heat, you get the next one. Uh, so when you heat up a gas, uh, you, you ionize it and you turn it into a plasma. So this ionized gas uh, exhibits really complex and collective behavior. Because it's ionized, uh, the free charges, positive and negative uh, charges in the plasma, they respond to electromagnetic fields. They self-generate their own electromagnetic fields um, and interact with those fields to create in sometimes very beautiful structures as if you've ever been fortunate enough to see the Northern and the Southern lights on our planet, um, the Aurora Borealis. Um, and uh, they can also be uh, controlled in, in very careful applications like a, a very nice neon on sign, for example. Um, so plasma physics, even separate from fusion on its own, plasma physics is a rich and beautiful discipline that presents many intellectual grand challenges and attracts some really great scientific minds. Basic plasma physics also has relevance to systems that are important for human health and well-being. So I'll spotlight uh, my department here for a little bit. Uh, some folks who don't work on fusion, Professor Nuno Loreiro and Professor Jack Hare, they're actually a theoretical expert and experimental expert on reconnection in plasma, how magnetic field lines uh, can sort of get into the right uh, circumstances so that a single field line can actually break apart and reconnect with another field line. So we care about reconnection, this really you know, interesting event, um, because of the environment that we all live in here on Earth. Uh, coronal mass ejections from the sun send out energetic particles uh, you know, racing towards us, and that affects space weather. NASA, in fact, has a billion dollar class mission to study reconnection in the Earth's magnetosphere because it is important for our life here on Earth. Just one example, there's others. In 2003, solar storms affected satellites, communications, and caused a power outage in Sweden uh, that was reported for about an hour. So there we go. Um, so in addition to basic plasma physics, there's plasma applications. So non-equilibrium, low temperature plasmas, and I'm already prepping you to think about temperature in a completely different way, the way plasma physicists think about it. So bear with me. Low temperature plasmas, a ah, thousand degrees C, <laughs> are used in plasma processing for many consumer goods. So, um, so if you look around you, and since we're all on Zoom, we're all sitting here with probably a uh, laptop in front of us, um, the, the LED backlight, the reflective coating um, on a lot of the, the elements there, those were all created through plasma processing. Um, if you're sitting here drinking out of a, a plastic bottle, potentially, uh, plasma processing was used to put down a, a protective layer and protective layers on wind turbines um, and uh, protective wear resistant coatings on aircraft turbines are also produced through plasma processing. So this is just the visual to kind of give you a sense that yes, plasmas aren't around us all the time, but applications of them are the low temperature plasmas. So now we emerge into fusion plasmas, which are different beasts entirely. Fusion energy plasmas are hot. They are hot and they are in very near thermal equilibrium at 150 million degrees Celsius. Uh, so that, that's definitely hot, even if you're, you're not just a plasma physicist. So the thermal equilibrium part is what leads to, many of you may know that nuclear fusion is called thermonuclear fusion. That thermo refers to the fact that it is uh, very nearly equilibrium. The positive and the negative charges, the electrons and the ions are going to have a chance to interact with each other and come to the same temperature. So everything kind of is settling now. And temperature is a very good measure of the average energy of the particles. And so we have to achieve these extreme temperatures because the Coulomb force dominates over the nuclear forces until the nuclei get very close together. So we want to bring the nuclei together, the deuterium and the tritium, in order to get that fusion reaction to happen. But that fusion reaction is very unlikely to happen. It's far more likely that those charged particles, two positive charges, are just going to swing in and bump off of each other and just scatter. 
So quantitatively, that's shown in, in the plot. The x-axis is the energy of a deuteron, and the y-axis is this uh, cross-section of probability for a reaction to occur. That Coulomb scattering, that just, you know, that just electromagnetic force moving them apart dominates by, you know, a factor of 100 over the probability, over the chance that you're going to get a DT fusion reaction. So these nuclei need lots and lots of energy to overcome the Coulomb barrier to get close enough to fuse. If it helps, this is not a bad analogy. It's like rolling heavy balls up a steep hill. Um, and so in this case, we're going to need a lot of these fuel ions, a lot of these balls being rolled up these uh, potential barriers here. So that means we've got to confine the plasma. So that's a key word. We have to hold this plasma together and hold the particles there at a high enough temperature, T, with enough particle density, N, these are the variables we use, for a long enough time, tau, if we want to get a useful amount of fusion energy out of many, many reactions occurring, because they have occur so rarely. So NT tau is, as a special name in fusion, called the triple product, and we want to boost this number up as highly as possible. And this is because, again, a significant fusion rate is needed if we're going to generate net fusion energy and overcome cooling of the plasma. Because if you're holding anything at 100 million degrees and you can't hold it in something as big as the sun on Earth, we have to put this plasma, this 100 million degree plasma, into a container. But the walls of the container have to be kept at a low enough temperature that they don't melt, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't have any container to think of. Uh, and so basically, this very hot plasma is going to constantly be trying to cool off because you have a gradient in temperature. So you're fighting, fighting, fighting against that all the time. And the way we push back against it is by applying external heating. So you see that this little green arrow, P in going into my plasma, which I show you in a cartoon, is just one reaction. We apply the external heating in order to get the deuterium and tritium fuel uh, in the hottest region of the plasma up to that, that magic temperature where fusion reactions have the most probability of occurring, 150 million degrees C. Once we have the reaction happen, that helium nucleus that's created will remain in the plasma and actually help us out. It comes out with a lot of energy. It's much, much uh, higher energy than the average energy, the fuel particles. So it actually will uh, transfer its energy back to the fuel. So we get some self-heating, which is what we want, uh, so that we can get net energy out efficiently. The neutron also leaves the plasma, which is a good thing. We don't want it in the plasma. We want it to come out and actually interact with our heat conversion system and with our fuel generation system. So this neutron will transfer its kinetic energy to a material that will wrap around the plasma. We'll call it a blanket. As that material heats up, we can pass a coolant through it and we can use that heat exchanger uh, to run turbines and generators. And as I mentioned briefly before, we can also interact that tritium with some, or excuse me, we can interact the neutron with some lithium to create more tritium and we can then feed this back into our reactor. So fighting against that cooling is a big part of what we're always doing. And this is because the hottest part of that plasma is rapidly losing energy. And we'll call this P out, uh, radiation plus conduction, plus what I work on, turbulence, all lead to rapid cooling of the plasma. So the problem is the confinement. So in order to hold the plasma together and confine it, we want to leverage properties of charged particles in a magnetic field so that we can confine this plasma for long periods of time. So there's a lot on this slide. There's a lot happening. But I want you to take away from this the notion that if we have a background magnetic field denoted by these uh, black lines with the arrows, and I'll say the strength of the field is B, and we drop an electron or we drop an ion into that background magnetic field, the, the Lorentz force is going to form a helical trajectory going around that magnetic field. And that trajectory is defined by a gyro radius, which is the distance that it's going to be, that the distance the particle is going to step away from the field line as it's undergoing this gyration, and the gyro frequency, which is basically one over the time it takes to complete uh, the, the gyration. And we've put the numbers in here so you can see at a five Tesla magnetic field, which is certainly stronger than you know, any MRI machine that you've interacted with, um, at a temperature of 10 keV, um, which is again at that upper 100 million degree realm, 
uh, you see you get uh, gyro radii, which are, which are sub-centimeters, so very, very tiny. So this helps us out. This means that the charged particles are confined. They are held very close, perpendicular to the B field lines and directed along these orbits. But because they're so hot, especially the ions, they're moving at 1,000 kilometers per second. So while they're undergoing this orbit, yes, they're confined perpendicular to the field because they're held in place to that distance of the gyro radius, but they can just zip along the field, basically shoot out the ends if you were to just create a solenoidal field, straight magnetic field. There's no confinement parallel to B. Now, even given that situation, there have been a lot of creative and really thoughtful ways of holding a plasma in place with a linear magnetic field, more or less, that is open. There's field uh, reverse configuration, Z pinches, mirror machines, lots and lots and lots of options. But it's really tough to combat that, so folks are still really looking at a way to break past that uh, open-ended barrier. And instead, on the fast track to fusion, the leading configurations are closed because we take that straight magnetic field line and we use large electromagnets or coils in fusion lingo that are made of superconductor. Uh, and we use maybe, you know, 10 of them uh, arranged into a donut shape, into a torus. So we take the magnetic field lines made by those electromagnets, pull them into a circular shape, pull them into a torus, and then the plasma is generated and held in place inside that toroidal shape. So the tokamak and the stellarator are two of the most common flavors of this uh, closed helical field line configuration. And the tokamak is the leading one. So again, on the fast track, what do you pick? You go with the tokamak because it has the best performance to date. So I'll introduce you quickly to a metric of success called capital Q. Uh, this is a uh, this is a plasma physics parameter, is not a parameter about a power plant. This capital Q is just describing when we get more energy produced by fusion reactions in the plasma than the amount of energy we've been using to heat the plasma up. Because we've got to obviously raise the temperature up very high to get all those reactions happening, and we need to be producing fusion energy from those reactions. So if Q is greater than one, you have a net energy plasma you still don't have net electricity or net energy device, but it's a net energy plasma core. So large tokamaks were at the boundary of achieving Q greater than one in the late 90s. So you can see in time, they've just steadily been stepping up to the right towards ignition. And this is a graph of the central temperature on the x-axis and the density times the confinement time and tau on the y-axis. So that, that triple product divided up into a plot it just shows the steady progress towards the line that would define uh, getting so much self-heating that you reach ignition and you can turn off that outside heating source altogether and at that point, you're at the stage where you can build a reactor out of it to get net electricity. So we were right at the boundary of achieving this net energy, this, this Q greater than one. And the record is about 0.67. That record is held by the JET tokamak uh, set in 1997. So achieving higher Q requires that we keep getting the high temperature and high density simultaneously that we can achieve, but we've got to get longer confinement times. So more or less, this talk would make no sense uh, years ago because no big leaps were made in Q since the 1990s. It was quite a stagnant time. So in order to help understand how we got to where we are today, let's go back just a little bit uh, to 2017, five years ago. So five years ago in 2017, the world was really rallied around uh, ITER a very large tokamak that was going to get us to Q greater than one to net energy by the late 2030s. In fact, it was designed to get a Q of 10. So ITER started in 1986 with an agreement with the European Union, Japan, the Soviet Union, and the USA uh, that they would jointly pursue ITER. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the late 90s, conceptual design work began. And by 2001, uh, the final design was approved. A little later on, 2003, 2005, two other international partners joined, and the location was selected, a beautiful place, Aix-en-Provence in southern France. But in 2017, ITER assembly had not yet started, and the cost had ballooned to something like 30 billion euro. And folks were getting really frustrated and really worried 
about the global fusion path uh, and about the path um, to show us from eater. And eater, in fact, means the way in Latin. And it was meant to be the way to show us diffusion. And it was what I wanted to work on when I started in graduate school. Um, so I'm glad I had some other tokamaks to work on because this one wasn't ready yet. Um, but anyway, the plan back then in 2017 was that after ITER, you would go to demo an even larger tokamak that would get you to net electricity. So I've snuck in a human here for scale. You might not have seen it on the ITER plot, but I've gone ahead and put it here uh, on the demo, the demo figure here. This is a big tokamak. So in 2017, Japan, Korea, India, Europe, and Russia were all planning to build this European demo, and it would be done by the early 2030s and operating in the 2040s. Uh, China was planning to explore the physics and technology issues for a test reactor uh, built in the 2020s, and they called that CFETR. So China was also planning to launch their own construction of a Chinese demonstration reactor in the, in the 2030s. So, so there was some pretty ambitious goals in 2017, but it was all along this path of going to much, much bigger machines. And the US fusion program at the time was facing some challenges. Alcator CMOD, which had operated at MIT for a while, had been shut down by the US Department of Energy. Operations at NSTXU, a tokamak at Princeton Plasma Physics Lab were stopped in late 2016, just after the machine had been upgraded and we were all planning to work on it uh, due to a failure of one of its copper poloidal coils. So that left just one of the three big US machines operating. And to help put this in context back then, there were only about 10 machines worldwide. So taking down CMOD, losing NSTXU to the coil failure, this was problematic. And so I'm showing you uh, CAD drawings, artist, artistic renderings. I'm showing you tokamaks on paper because we were really worried that might be all we had to work on in the US. And we saw the strong international competition and a need for innovation and a bold vision and things started to bubble up. And so in 2018, there was a major announcement that MIT was going to partner with industry and partner with a startup company, Commonwealth Fusion Systems, to build the world's first net energy fusion experiment. Uh, and here you see some other people for scale, they're the same size people, the tokamak is just smaller. Spark is a tokamak predicted to achieve Q greater than two under conservative assumptions. When you open up those assumptions and make them the same assumptions as ITER, Spark is predicted to achieve Q of about 10. So matching ITER performance in a package that I think is something like 64 times smaller volume. It's very impressive. So the Spark tokamak is all about accelerating development of fusion as a carbon-free source of energy. Um, and this collaboration between MIT and CFS was to build the tokamak. And they've been carrying out rapid staged research to develop specifically high temperature superconductors for the magnets to use in the tokamak. So Dennis White is the director of the Plasma Science and Fusion Center, the PSFC, a faculty member in our department. Zach Hartwig, a junior faculty member in our department is the lead on the magnet technology. And the folks you see in this picture here are all current students or alums uh, who have been really playing a key role in the research excellence and the team leadership uh, at Spark as part of this collaboration, a very innovative uh, collaboration that took a lot of time to sort out. And I believe the, the contract that was settled on between CFS and MIT actually won an award uh, for these kinds of agreements. So innovating even when it comes to administration is, is what MIT is all about. So achieving the same cue, they're both tokamaks. What's similar about them? Well, the physics is the same in Spark and Eater. Um, and and in this, is, this is good for us because for many, many years, and in fact, all of my research had all been about taking a really high fidelity uh, first principles model for the turbulence in plasmas, this, this leading cause of the heat mixing and the cooling of the plasma, uh, taking these high fidelity models and validating them very carefully about with measurements on as many tokamaks as possible so that we could come up with the a uh, predictive model that we would have the most confidence in to predict performance in ITER. So when Spark came along, we said, let's turn this around and use these same models, these same tools that are well validated that we're using to predict ITER and predict Spark, because it's the same physics. 
Uh, so scientists at MIT, I'm very proud of him. Pablo Rodriguez Fernandez is an alum of the department. He's now a research scientist at MIT. He's my former student. Um, he and some other colleagues have developed a new machine learning based method to predict conditions in the hottest part of a fusion plasma using advanced turbulence simulations. So starting with a fundamental model of how the turbulence is generated, how it is driven, how it is damped, how it rolls over and interacts with itself and uh, you know, sort of moves heat and particles around, he's able to take that and predict what the profile should look like in Spark. The most important being the temperature Te and Ti at rho equal to zero, because that's the hottest part core of the plasma. And you see he's predicting uh, for Ti and Te you know, in the range of 15 to 25 uh, kilo electron volts, which is where you need to be 200, 250 million degrees C to guarantee fusion, yes. And even more than that, uh, he and his coworkers predict that Spark should become the world's first burning plasma, reaching Q of eight in the primary reference discharge. And uh, did I mention fast track? Uh, this is this is all in a couple of years away, right? In about five years, they're going to be done with this tokamak and starting to run some of these scenarios that he's uh, that he's working on. So let's come back to Eater and Spark. Let's peel back the layers a little bit more because whoa, 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 like we just build it smaller. Why did it take you so long? This was obvious, right? Like, so what's going on here? Well, first of all, let's just take a moment and soak this in. This is the size difference between Spark and Eater. I've tried to scale it using the humans uh, for scale, which I've circled in red. It's, it's very impressively huge. So same physics, different size. So what's going on? It's the technology. The technology difference between Spark and Eater is absolutely huge. So Spark can leverage a new technology that sort of broke onto, broke into the market, came into availability just about seven years ago. High temperature superconductor or HTS. High temperature superconductors can operate at very high magnetic field. And shown here in the picture is just a picture of some Rebco tape that you can that you can purchase. Uh, this is made industrially, and it has a lot of different layers around it to hold the Rebco, uh, the green superconductor in place uh, in this little sandwich of a very strong nickel alloy uh, substrate. In contrast, the low temperature superconductors, LTS, that were available to the fantastic minds when they were designing ITER, this is all they had in the 90s and it could only operate at low magnetic field. So the folks who designed ITER didn't get to have the same technology choices as the folks who designed Spark. And as we'll see in a moment, that's what led to the vast difference in size of the tokamaks. It all comes down to how strong you can make the magnetic field, which shouldn't surprise you at this point, because a few slides ago, you remembered that's fundamentally what we use to confine the particles, the strength of B to pull those particles into their Larmor orbits. So ITER is big because the magnetic field is low. Spark is small because the magnetic field is high. Uh, to get a little more specific, you can do some calculations, and we do this actually in our undergraduate, uh, in our undergraduate fusion classes in the department. We can make some assumptions and show that fusion power scales like the size of the device, so the major radius of the torus R, it scales like R times the strength of the magnetic field to the fourth power. So it scales like R times B to the fourth power. So this means that B is a big lever, even bigger than R, but you have a choice as an engineer, build a larger device, bigger R, or use a higher magnetic field, bigger B. Either way, it gets you more fusion performance in the tokamak. So you can calculate uh, that fusion gain factor Q as a function of magnetic field and size and plot it as shown here on the left, where the contours are for fusion gain Q of 0.2, 1, 5, and 20. And you just say, well, spark design with high temperature superconductors, high magnetic field magnets, I can build those magnets to give me 12 Tesla on axis in the plasma, build them out of Rebco. So I come over to 12 Tesla and I say, well, I want to achieve, you know, Q of two or, or something on Spark. And so I move up and I find somewhere where Q of two is. And then I come to the left and I say, oh, well, that means my tokamak is two meters. And the same design carried out in the 90s with the folks who had to do this for ITER, right? ITER had to be made with the available low temperature superconductors, low B field magnets. 
the magnetic field on axis they could make was 5.3 Tesla. That was the highest you could get uh, with the niobium tin. So come over on the X axis to five Tesla, move up to the Q you want for ITER, Q of 10, and then come to the left and see how big your device has to be, six meters. And so this is really the difference uh, between, between the two plasmas, not the physics, uh, just the engineering and technology that was available. But when Spark was announced, you know, this was totally new. This, this, this uh, Rebco only existed in tapes. No coil existed, no magnet existed. And people said, we don't think you can build these HTS magnets because they'd never been built before. So uh, I searched around on the internet and there seems to be a, a quote by Amar Bose, uh, who's, who's you know, well known to us at MIT, something about, you know, if someone's doing something impossible, don't interrupt them. And I believe it's also an old Chinese proverb. And so the way I like to think about it is a little bit differently. Don't tell anyone at MIT that something's impossible because then they're gonna go and do it. So it's, it's a very exciting place to be. So I wanna uh, spotlight here, Professor Zach Hartwig, the lead on the magnet technology. Um, he's an alum of our department, had his PhD in 2012. Uh, he's also a professor in our department. He is one of the original six co-founders of CFS, which was one of the original portfolio companies of the engine at MIT. This is Commonwealth Fusion Systems. And I believe uh, five out of six folks are all actually MIT alums and four out of them are uh, PhD alums from, from our department. So I'm beaming with pride. I knew all of, all of these folks when they were students, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. So the big challenge then is building large scale, high field, high temperature superconductor cables that you can then make into magnets. And so the challenge is really how do you achieve a high current carrying capacity in this new cable with sufficient mechanical strength, sufficient cryogenic cooling, and of course, low electrical resistivity. And so what's shown up at the top, and there's an arrow for scale to show you how big this is, this is a, a rendering of a test assembly with two three meter long HTS cables in it. And what you see uh, in this, uh, in, in the light metal contraption up at the top is actually where these cables are being uh, connected and held by a demountable joint, which is also a big innovation of Zach's. And what you can see on the bottom is a high temperature cable prepared for testing at a facility in, in Switzerland at the Sultan facility. So his solution to this challenge was he came up with a unique assembly of high temperature superconductor that would be sitting within a robust manufacturable package. Um, and his key innovation to do this is a vacuum pressure impregnation solder process that they used to create a monolithic metal cable out of all of those little tiny strips of superconductor. So showing you how that works on this next page here, let's start up at the top with the HTS tape. Um, so what's important about this HTS tape, as Zach was explaining to me, is the sandwich of it. The Rebco, the superconductor, is that light blue there that, or sorry, I'm sorry, it's the gray right there that you see in green. This Rebco is sandwiched between um, copper, but also on the bottom, a nickel alloy substrate. And so this nickel alloy substrate is much, much stronger than copper. And it produces a rigidity that HTS tape will have, which is non-existent in a low temperature superconductor. And so Zach sort of um, thought about this a little bit and said, well, let's use this to our advantage and let's make a twisted tape stack. And that's what you see happening here. So he's kind of leveraging the mechanical properties and let's stack all of the tapes together. So you get this sort of increased help out with the strength and then twist them together. And then so then you could make a basically a cross section of them and you would see a whole lot of these stacked together and you see that square cross section in the middle part, in the middle portion. So there's four light gray cross sections. Inside each one of those is a whole bunch of HDS tape stacked together. And what he realized is that you are always gonna have to hold the high temperature superconductor in a metal matrix, that's the former, uh, but you can head into a space where the cryogenic cooling becomes much simpler because the HTS superconductor and copper 
have decent or copper has a very high thermal conductivity, even at the low temperatures where the superconductor is sitting. So the copper can give you not just mechanical stability, but can also give you a very straightforward cooling capability. So basically all you have to do to manage your electrical conductivity and your cooling is embed the HCS tape stacks correctly in the metal matrix former. And then you don't need many complex cooling channels. You just extrude one continuous coolant channel and pass the coolant, the liquid helium or what have you down that channel. And that's enough to keep this all at the right temperature for the superconductor to behave, but it's a high enough temperature for the copper and the metal matrix former to give you good electrical and thermal conductivity between the different ATS tape stacks. And so this allowed them to actually build a full magnet, a full you know, two scale uh, functioning superconducting magnet coil out of the humble little tapes at the top. So this tape, this cable he built was called Viper. It was, it was published in the open literature. It was proven viable for all conditions. And so what's shown here in this plot is from his paper. It's the cycle number of their test and the superconducting performance on the top. And as you see, as they increase the number of cycles going to the right, there's extraordinarily small degradation. So the y-axis, you can think about this as just being your critical current. You don't want this to drop. And indeed, you see it stays high for all the tests you've conducted. So these cables were proven to work. They're proven to be highly stable against temperature excursions. They had nano-ohm scale electrical resistance in all of the joints that were created under full load. So this basically means you know, victory. You prove that HTS cables can be built out of this tape. And now what you need to do is move beyond just the cable and construct a full toroidal field magnet, one of these 10 big magnets that you're gonna use to create that confining field that goes around in the donut shape. You need to build this toroidal field magnet to demonstrate this technology at scale that you need for Spark. So that's what came next uh, for Zach and the team. In 2021, the rapid churn of innovation at MID produced the world's first 20 Tesla HTS magnet after just three years. So these were built on campus at the MIT Plasma Fusion Center. Once again, humans for scale. Uh, so if it helps out uh, the, the, the gentleman here in the white that is standing there in the, in the upper right, he's leaning over um, the cable, you can see, or I'm sorry, the magnet, you can see it's a D shape and there's a little drawing of it on the left. So all of the superconducting uh, tapes have been formed and molded into shape into this D-shaped toroidal field coil. And then in order to test the field coil, they actually use Viper cables uh, to electrically connect it to their power sources. And then he's standing in uh, what is essentially a, a cryo chamber that they're gonna use to, to manage all of the, to keep everything at the right temperature. So this innovation is just the beginning. It's opening a lot of new doors. Uh, Zach was the leader and project head for the demonstration. And now he's head of engineering at the PSFC at, uh, at MIT. So moving ahead to this year, MIT has expanded the research collaboration with Commonwealth Fusion Systems to build a net energy fusion machine, Spark. Uh, there's a new five-year agreement in place. This five-year agreement focuses on the Spark science, on increasing uh, graduate student and postdocs working on the project, as well as all of the interdisciplinary work towards fusion power plants. So there's a lot of good quotes here uh, from the mighty director, Bob Armstrong, you know, about leveraging the MIT ecosystem, really getting everybody involved and allowing startups uh, to, to just really, you know, thrive in this environment. And a uh, good quote from Bob Mumgard about this being a very effective collaboration and they're enabling the world's first commercially relevant net energy fusion device. So it's, here it is in 2022. This is a photo from Commonwealth Fusion Systems. This is the CFS Magnet Factory in Spark being built in Devons, Massachusetts. It's um, very beautiful and very exciting to see this tokamak, uh, tokamak site coming together. Um, we're all going to be really looking forward to working on Spark. And uh, also in 2022, we're still looking forward to working on ITER as well. ITER also installed the first of their nine magnet modules. So you can see um, this D shape up there on the left. That is also a superconducting magnet, toroidal field magnet made of uh, niobium tin low temperature superconductor compared to the uh, 
high temperature superconducting magnet made of the uh, high temperature superconductor like Rebco. So this research at MIT, this fast track for Spark, good progress on ETHER, they're just part of the story of new horizons for the fusion ecosystem. And so a lot of these reports uh, that Megan mentioned at, at the beginning and community activities has helped us build between 2018 and 2021, a consensus that we're moving forward quickly on this new energy mission for fusion. And specifically this one from the National Academies of Sciences, I wanna highlight for you that was published in 2021, bringing fusion to the US grid that Dennis White, the director of the PSFC was actually one of the authors of. Um, this basically said to ensure US leadership as well as impact transition to net zero, work for climate change on time, uh, DOE and the private sector need to team up and demonstrate net electricity uh, in a really rapid time frame. And demonstrating net electricity means building the next step after Spark, after net energy. You have to get to a net electricity so-called fusion pilot plant. And they're pushing on public-private partnerships. They want a milestone-based fusion development program, much like uh, the NASA COTS uh, system was in place. And urgent investments are needed to do this um, on a decadal timescale. And so you're also here perhaps this evening because of the huge growth in public interest. I mean, fusion is pretty much everywhere you look. And so folks are thinking about fusion in a way they never have done before, including you know, debating its relevance for climate change, which I think is amazing because it means fusion is actually moving fast enough that people are thinking about it on that kind of time scale. And hopefully we can get there. Also in 2022, fusion energy and fusion technology companies were just, just bursting at the seams. This is the Fusion Industry Association membership. And the, um, you can see there's many, many companies, including, of course, uh, homegrown Commonwealth Fusion Systems there. And in March 2022, this was a big deal, their White House held a summit and announced that the US had an ambitious new plan to demonstrate the feasibility of commercial fusion energy on a decadal timescale. Um, and again, pushing that a game-changing innovation like fusion could help us get to net zero using the decades of progress on the physics that I talked about, um, sustained bipartisan support by the government. And fusion can also distinguish itself as an energy technology uh, that can engage with society right now and gain a lot of acceptance uh, when we're thinking about uh, new energy sources. Um, really thinking about all the benefits for the United States. And it's, it's an ambitious thing that has to be done involving, again, private sector and the government. So why are we here then being able to move so quickly? Tried to kind of put together some of the ingredients for a fast track to fusion. Um, you know, the government pays attention when there's a growth in private funding, and you can see the number of billions of dollars going to the fusion industry as a function of time in this plot. We're now sitting at a $2 billion fusion industry, which has, I think, for the first time ever in history, exceeded the DOE FES funding shown in blue. Combining that with the community consensus, where we know we're ready to do this, we have the design capabilities for a pilot plant, we can explore the ways to accelerate the fusion uh, research and development broadly via public-private partnerships, and we have experiences and models of how successful private partnerships work. The Commercial Orbital Transportation Services, this was the NASA COTS milestone-based program that enabled SpaceX. Um, and we also have bipartisan support and enacted legislation, the Energy Act of 2020 and the FY22 Appropriations Act that are actually uh, specifically calling out these community reports and guiding the DOE plan. So it's really, for the first time, everything's falling into place. And the race is on. The U.S. is doing this and they want to go fast. We want to go fast, but there's international competition. So I want to point out that um, our colleagues in the U.K. and in China, they've also proposed a spherical tokamak for energy production and ambitious program targeting 2040 for a prototypical pilot plant to demonstrate net electricity. Um, and at the, at, at the HEFE, at the Chinese Academy of Sciences, they're proposing the CFETR, which should be done around 2035 and aims for a peak power output of two gigawatts. So the race is on for pilot plants. And 
I think our department is in the race. I think we're, we're part of this. Um, and of course, one of the most important things we can do is train the future leaders who are going to be part of this uh, new fusion industry and all of these uh, very important scientific discoveries and technological advancements. So our department, we work on fission, we work on fusion and plasmas, we work on security and policy, we work on quantum engineering. Um, and we link all of these together through the intellectual commons of advanced computing, modeling, and simulation, materials in extreme environments, nuclear reactions, and radiation. And there you have all the things we need to, to keep fusion on the fast track, uh, computing, materials, and of course, experience and expertise in nuclear systems. So our department is attracting some really amazing students. We offer two undergraduate degrees, one of them ABET accredited, the other one not, uh, but is very, very flexible. We've seen a 40% increase in undergraduate majors this last year. We've uh, increased number of grad applications at admissions tremendously. Someone told me it was the record size class, something like 53 students admitted, but I haven't checked the history historical data to know if that's true, but it's a big number. Um, and they don't just want to work on fusion. They are also wanting to work uh, on quantum engineering and fission and security. So there's just a big increase in nuclear, but fusion is really, yeah, front and center pulling people in. Uh, we've partnered with, legals, uh, with leaders for global operations at MIT uh, so that uh, master students can get a dual MBA and an SM degree. And we are also attracting the best faculty. Two new folks have started with us in the last two years, and we have an active search going on jointly with the College of Computing for health of the planet. And so I'm really excited about this. And um, I hope I can come back and tell you more about that at, at some later point in time. Uh, we collaborate closely, obviously, with the Plasma Science and Fusion Center, an interdepartmental center at MIT. Uh, all of us uh, NSC faculty in the PSFC, in fact, I'm missing someone, I feel terrible about that. Um, we're, we're all over there, basically, uh, at the PSFC doing our research and working with our students down on Albany Street. Uh, NSC is, of course, the academic home for plasma physics and fusion, but PSFC is a world-leading university research center for the study of plasma and fusion science and technology, and they've got a lot of exciting stuff going on there. So how could we engage together more? Um, uh, Edith, who's, who's, on this, uh, who's on the Zoom with us tonight, she's our leadership giving officer. Just get in touch with her. She can help funnel you into a lot of different things. Um, you can sign up for a newsletter list. We will not spam you. It's only four times a year with a lot of highlights about the department. You can sign up for our alumni updates. Uh, again, no spam. We do this once a year in September. It's live on Zoom. It's a lot of fun. I believe we're going to have Jacobo Buongiorno talking uh, with us in September about nuclear batteries to transform fission energy to decarbonize all sectors of, of the economy. Um, we have a formal NSC alumni mentoring network that you can volunteer for, share your knowledge, share your experience, share your passion uh, with career advice, perspectives, and support for our students. And of course, I would love to hear from you. I've been talking too much. I'd love to hear from you. So it'd be great if we got to meet um, and I got to host you at some campus visits and uh, other ways, of course, that you can help us win the race, um, gifts that help us continue to train future leaders working in fusion and using your voice, which is a very powerful voice uh, to share news about the promise of fusion and the MIT role in fusion. Share that with your network, share that with policymakers. It helps us spread the word. So I should stop there. I'm probably over uh, by maybe five, five minutes or so, I'm not sure. So thank you so much. I will stop sharing and, and come back with, with Megan and Mia. Awesome, thank you so much, Professor White. Uh, that was really amazing talk and we've got a lot of great questions. Uh, there's no way we're gonna get to all of them, but- um, Email afterwards. I, I know what I've opened myself up for, but I'm willing to do it. <laughs> Email afterwards would be a lot of fun. Um, and I may even end up connecting you to my colleagues for some of the meteor questions. Perfect. Um, okay, so our first one is IPCC scientists are chaining themselves to the White House gates because IPCC, IPCC understates the urgency of the climate crisis. If we must create a complete new renewable energy network in the next couple of decades, how does nuclear fusion energy, perhaps arriving decades later, fit into the already complex network? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point. And so I think what's really nice about Fusion is that it can be an extraordinarily flexible uh, base load source. And so we're always going to need that, even as we also expand uh, renewables, even as we transform our grid. And so the, the really good thing about Fusion is if we can move fast enough, we can actually help uh, impact and basically mitigate climate change a little bit by reducing carbon emissions, um, moving towards net zero, of course. But also we have to remember, we've got to be able to adapt and adaptation is going to take a lot of energy. And so I'm confident that um, fusion, even in, in the later years of this, of this century will be playing a very key role in helping, in helping ensure human health and well-being. So it's, um, it's, it's again, it's safe, it's clean, it's, it, it can be flexibly deployed where you need it. Um, with the very, very minimum waste concerns. And so it's a, it's a very good option uh, to continue uh, as, as we get to net zero. Awesome. Uh, how, does a, how hot does a neutron and proton have to get before the bonds between quarks get too weak to hold the particles together? I'll have to look that one up and tell you. Um, so, but uh, one, one, one quick thing is we can do a couple of back of the envelope things and show that for these plasmas, the quantum effects are not important. We can also show the effects of gravity are not important. The two dominant forces in these plasmas for these conditions are the electromagnetic force uh, and the strong nuclear forces and to just, to just combine the deuterium and tritium. So but it's a good question. Um, but not, not one that we think impacts the design of tokamaks. Not to say it doesn't impact other fusion systems, but not tokamaks. Okay. Um, so Chris Harding says, I've read that the corrosion of the reactor wall material can be a problem. What is the expected lifetime of a Commonwealth, of a Commonwealth fusion type reactor? Yeah, so I actually am not sure what they are using for their first wall. Um, so let me talk about other common first wall materials that, that we do use and talk about uh, corrosion and other processes that deteriorate those walls and, and cause problems for us. So we need to use uh, metal walls, high refractory materials. Obviously, they have to have a very high melting point. We have to exhaust the heat from the plasma appropriately at the right kind of spot uh, on, these, on these types of surfaces. And so we, we care a lot about how they're going to stand up and how long they're going to live and how, what the lifetime is going to be. So the types of materials that people are thinking about now for net energy tokamaks are things like uh, tungsten, uh, things like uh, molybdenum. There's also some, some walls made of different alloys, including beryllium, like the Eater first wall, which has been uh, tested out as a material in jet. So these can stand up uh, pretty decently for our studies on net energy fusion devices, meaning we can get you know, a good you know, decade out of them. But folks are talking about in our field that there are serious, uh, you know, thoughts is would they stand up for 40, 50, 60 years, the kind of timeline that we are used to when we think about fission reactors uh, lifetime. And so this is a major gap area is fusion materials and fusion technology. And we have to accelerate uh, how quickly we test out materials to see if they're actually gonna have the right kind of lifetime that you need and avoid corrosion and avoid other problems. And this is also happening uh, at the PSFC, uh, Zach Hartwig again, who I mentioned, and Professor Mike Short, who's an expert in materials. They're working on uh, using a very novel intermediate energy proton beam. Uh, to irradiate materials. And with protons, you can actually mimic the damage you get from fusion neutrons, which is very cool. Uh, but you can do it in a tabletop uh, experiment very inexpensively and most importantly, very quickly. So this is the type of R&D that the White House Fusion Summit and all of the uh, community reports have highlighted as a major need, because it's a gap. The fusion plasma physics really, you know, in hand, the fusion materials for a pilot plant, we worry. Fusion materials for net energy, not a problem. Also, you're, you're not gonna make enough neutrons in just a net energy plant to cause damage over that much time. But once you go to a plant, a pilot plant or a re reactor, you know, operating decades and decades, it becomes a serious concern. Uh, so proof of principle versus industrial scale are usually decades apart. Um, what is some, a realistic time schedule um, when, might we, when might we see energy from fusion becoming commercially available? 
Yeah, it's it's a great point. I mean, the, the pressure is on. We want to try to get to the pilot point in 10 years. And with enough public-private partnership, we're hoping that we can basically have a product at the end of that decade, a Cato timeline for the pilot plant, that the industry wants to buy. That's, that's going to be a key question for, for slowing this down or speeding it up. And one of the panelists there uh, with me in the photograph was Mark Berry of Southern Company. And this at the White House Fusion Summit. And this was the point he was making, which is, you know, it will be decades if you don't give me something turnkey. If you don't give me something in your pilot, if your pilot plant is not ready for me to take down to the yard and give it to my folks there and have them, you know, try to break it it is gonna be decades. And so, you know, if we can front load this plan for the pilot plant, already thinking about the customer in mind, Mark Berry's point was, you can sort of shrink that time. And, and, I, and I, I think he's right. And so most of the companies and the three countries looking at this that we mentioned, China, the UK and the US, um, you know, we're talking a decade to a pilot plant and then very shortly thereafter, some commercialization. So people are, people are pretty ambitious. Very exciting. Um, could I um, could Eater be retrofitted with HTS? I know it's a big deal and would take years, but would it be worth it? I don't know if it would be worth it um, because once Eater is operating, it will have capabilities that no other tokenback, not even Spark, will have. Uh, because Eater will have an extraordinarily complete set of measurements, and we will be able to look at the burning plasma in far more detail than in any other device that would be built by a private company on a fast timeline. And the reason for that is Eater's a science experiment. It's not for profit. A private company's got to make profit, so they got to make choices. They're probably going to say, I don't need to measure uh, you know, the detailed structure of the alphane eigenmodes with an ECE imaging system and because I just need a single point measurement in the core to tell me my temperature is hot enough. And I would say, you're right, don't bother building all these systems, but Eater needs them as a science experiment. So I would say it would be worth it to retrofit Eater or change Eater in any way, HTS or otherwise, only if we were going to get some more scientific benefit out of it, because that's what Eater is going to give us. And that's what Eater is going to give the fusion industry because it's government, because it's nonprofit, because it's so international, the, the knowledge base is going to be shared in a, in a very different way and a very healthy way. Uh, to be synergistic with what to, with how fast the private how fast private industry has to move, and they're not going to do science, right? They're not. They're not going to stop and look at the exciting thing. Only us scientists on Eater are going to stop and look at this cool little wiggle that we care about. The 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 folks building the the pilot plant, they're not going to stop for that. So it's it's got to be worth it and compatible with the mission of Eater. It's a great question, though. Uh, okay. So I think probably one more and then we might be out of time. Uh, what is the smallest device that you could make that would still have Q greater than one? Could you make something that's desktop sized? No, but it, has, it doesn't have a whole lot to do with plasma physics, in fact, right? Because let's argue, let's argue plasma physics. Increase the magnetic field, really, really enormous, enormous, squish it, squish it, squish it, down, down, down. So now I've got my, my soda can, my seltzer can, you know, reactor sitting here. This is the size of it. Where are the neutrons going? So this might be Q greater than one, maybe, but not really highly plausible, but you could never get the net electricity because you still would need like a meter of shielding on this thing to slow down the fusion neutrons because they come out of the soda can, they come out of spark, they come out of eater at the same energy. And so we still have to shield them. So if you do a calculation just on the, the nuclear physics of it, the shielding you need, the amount of material to slow down the neutrons, capture the energy, um, a commercial reactor would not fit on the back of a truck. Uh, it, would, it would have to be much bigger than that. And so you can see a facility, something a little bit bigger uh, than Devon's or up to Eater scale is how big you have to get. So you can shrink it down a bit by arguing plasma physics, but then once you stick to get beyond the plasma physics and argue for all of the associated systems to capture the fusion energy and, and make electricity or make useful heat, you, you can't shrink it down. Spark, uh, Spark I think, is even uh, smaller than what we imagine a tokamak pilot plant would be for a lot of other reasons. So um, almost as small as you can go is, is what you see so far. But there's always something new to discover. But just known physics, known technology today, that's where we are. Okay. 
Great, cool. Um, any parting words you'd like to leave the uh, leave the seminar with? Thank you. And reach out. We also have an online MOOC. If anyone wants to, to take it in the department, we can send out a link to that. Um, we, would, we would really love to keep answering your questions offline. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming and talking to us. Thank you for uh, on behalf of the Club of Boston and uh, myself and the other panelists as well. It's been really in great talking with you. Uh, really interesting discussion. And I look forward to learning more and more about nuclear fusion. I look forward to these great questions and uh, thanks everyone for, for, for listening in. Thanks again. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, we will be uh, posting the recording of this on our YouTube channel, along with many other excellent, excellent uh, seminars. Thanks all. Good night.